I'm Fleur Elizabeth. And I'm Amy Shepherd. And we are hosting a new podcast called Bombshells. Yeah, let's get started. It's Mr. Stephen Ergington. Hello, Stephen. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hello. You smell lovely. I smell lovely. Oh, That's very kind. What is it? Um, deodorant. <laughs> Aftershave. <laughs> I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> well, so Stephen is a journalist at The Telegraph. Uh, video comment editor. Is that correct? That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Mm. Um, he published the internationally covered Kim Darrett cables, um, ran the Brexit Party online campaign in the EU election, and was the host of the Sun's Burning Questions series. So, you really yeah. have done your research. And yes. he is only 24, so very impressive. Yes. Got, got that there. Yeah, but you're 24, but you're all. You've already accomplished quite a lot. Your your work has just gone from strength to strength. <laughs> oh, that's very kind of you to say. <laughs> yeah, but you've done. You've achieved a lot for a the, the, a tender twenty four year old. So. Um, <laughs> well, I feel like it's not um, that young. men used to have families at this age. No, that's so true. Yeah, You'll but yeah, yeah. So what are you, you trying to say? So, but so, if I'm right, so you're the you're the video comment editor at Telegraph and you've had some really good documentaries um like the NatCon one is the one I really know about yeah to be honest star star of the NatCon well you made that film work really well (laughs) she missed the thumbnail that's why I got all the views (laughs) (laughs) I'll tell you Stephen I know is a very very gracious man because he could have made me look like an absolute tit that in that video because the amount of rubbish I was chatting and then he texts me a few, like about a month later after NatCon to say, just to let you know, I've made you the star of the show. Um, here's, here's the link. <laughs> I was like, shit, I am the... <laughs> well, we made you a star. <laughs> yeah. no, everyone's been saying for months, who is the girl from the NatCon video? I've been like, asked is, that is she real? <laughs> is she a spy? Is she trans? <laughs> yeah, there's a comment in there saying, who's that trans woman at whatever time? <laughs> but we we very now reveal... It's the lovely Amy It's Shepard. me. It's um, me. Yeah, you also interviewed my hero, Jordan B. Peterson. Yeah. Um, who I absolutely fangirled over when I met. So, and you kept your cool. Um, I've yeah. interviewed him twice now. Yeah. Um, I'm a big, obviously also a big fan of his. Uh, when I was a teenager, reading some of his works, uh, watch, definitely watching him on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and I always sort of had it in my mind Ever since I was a kid, I was like, Stephen, one day you will interview him. Like, I just know it will happen. Yeah. And um, I started off by interviewing his daughter, actually, yeah. a few years ago when I was working at The Sun. And she's obsessed with this, like, lion diet. Mm-hmm. I don't know if yes. you've heard of this, where you just eat steak. That's, steak that's the and thing you do. salt and water. Mm. Yeah. I remember, because I was at ARC. Were you at ARC? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I was very surprised that... They had lovely food on, but I was really expecting, you know, this was Jordan Peterson Conference. This was his opportunity to get us all eating the lion diet. And there wasn't any steak. There was just sort of coronation chicken. and Well, that's sound, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah I suppose. But, um, but, but I, was, yeah. I was hoping for some steaks that would have been good, especially for the ticket prices. Well, I think they'd had these weird, I don't know, have you ever done any of these diets? When <laughs> no. doing... You've done keto, haven't you? I've done keto. Um, um, I... I the, most obscure thing I've done is a three-day fast, which I've done quite often. Well, Rishi does that, doesn't I he? I feel great. Rishi doesn't do it quite as long as me, but he does it every week. It's quite extraordinary. Um, yeah. But just to finish off the story about, his, <laughs> about Jordan Peterson, yes. um, I interviewed his daughter what, yeah. about this lion diet, thing, mm. but also at the time, it was during the COVID pandemic, and she told me that her dad got COVID and he was very ill at the time. Um, with all sorts of withdrawal symptoms from his benzodiazepine drugs, and he was in Serbia or something. Anyway, so we got this big sort of kind of scoop for the sun, like Jordan mm. Beeson has COVID, you know, will he live, will he die? Like, you know, it was kind of like really intense thing. And then after that, I just, from <clears throat> getting to know her a little bit, Michaela, who's really, really nice. Yeah. Um, eventually, I managed to secure an interview with her dad, and then mm. he le- luckily let me do a second one. Yep. And we went to his sort of lake house uh, sort of, pad in Canada last year and it was really really interesting yeah yeah no I was so happy for you when I saw you got that um because I think everybody wanting to get into journalism probably not everybody but our side of the fence well that's probably their dream but you 
you got into that straight away um and you did you did that so quickly and most people getting to that kind of level of journalism they've, they've probably they're probably just coming out of a of a postgrad in journalism but you've just got there quite quickly in your own way so like how yeah how? i didn't go to uni um which i think helped in many ways because it gave me a three-year head start in a way so when i was a teenager i was a very like nerdy kid at school no really, yeah. no seriously <laughs> <laughs> I, know you, I know it's a big surprise for many people <laughs> Um, you were a jock. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really sort of into like history, yeah. um, a bit into politics and stuff. And I was watching Nigel on, on YouTube, Nigel Farage. And I was watching his speeches. I don't know if you've ever seen these famous speeches to the European Parliament. And he oh, would yeah, say yeah. things like, um, you know, Mr. Van Rompuy, no one's ever heard of you or whatever. <laughs> Who are you? Yeah, exactly. Who are you? Yeah, nobody, nobody in Europe's <laughs> ever heard of you. And that really kind of got me as a young man yeah. sort of interested in, in politics. I, so this is really what got me into politics. My, I was raised political. My parents met through the Conservative Party. Um, mm. But when I was 16, that was when Brexit was going on. And I remember going to see, it was the Vote Leave um, sort of road show. And they went to the Sage in Gateshead and it was uh, Nigel and the Labour woman. Uh, no, you mean the Northern Irish woman. Kate the curly hair, yeah. Um, and just the the atmosphere was absolutely incredible. It was like, I, I, I'd i been to pop concerts then and I thought that this was so much more exciting. It just felt like something was really yeah. like brewing and there was this, like something was about to happen, <laughs> something huge. And that was really what kicked off my political interest well it's so, interesting yeah. because i think in well the, we're the same age aren't we so. yeah exactly and i think mm. in the 80s you had a lot of kids who were obsessed with margaret thatcher mm. who became kind of conservative mps or conservative yeah. activists later yeah and i think farage had a big influence again because of his presence on youtube on many like younger people mm -hmm. and i know like i know people who are similar to us yeah who've also been kind of almost inspired by nigel's charisma and his interest in yeah in brexit and everything yeah the reason the reason i got interested in politics was like around just a couple of years before Brexit. Mm -hmm. So you had Trump and then we had Brexit and then you had Trump. But what what nailed it home for me is all of the really arrogant dickheads that I grew up with. Um, they were all such hypocrites. They were really not very nice, mm -hmm. but they would virtue signal all the time. They could, just couldn't do a nice thing. But they also would uh, would vote really left wing and shame anyone else that was voting for Brexit. And I bro voted Brexit. I was basically the only person I knew that voted Brexit. Um, but the how nasty everyone was, and I was so isolated growing up because of it. It just was like I've just got to double down. Yeah. And but um, but Nigel, like then when I went to uni, I would I couldn't go to sleep without watching his LBC show <laughs> because this nice, lovely, gravelly voice <laughs> would send me to sleep and it would calm me down at the end because I did a theatre degree, so I was surrounded by nut jobs the whole yeah. day. And I was like, a way for me not to go insane was to listen to Nigel at the end of the day. And his LBC show would finish, it would go from seven till 10 and I go to sleep at 10. So it was up, ready on YouTube, play, <sighs> love it. But yeah. to finish my story about how, how I sort of got into journalism, if that's, if that's your original question, <laughs> um, I was watching Nigel obviously, and then I made my own YouTube page actually when I was a teenager and um, went and interviewed lots of journalists and politicians and things. And I would just cold call them or email them and I'd be very persistent and just over six months if they're like, no, I'm too busy. I'm like, no, can we do it this time, blah, blah. And um, eventually got some of them on and some of the interviews did quite well on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I just, as soon as I was uh, finishing my A-levels, I got a text from someone who wanted to hire me. It's my first job in journalism in London. And when I was 18, I moved to London mm -hmm. and I've been here since then. So what's that, six, almost six years now. Um, and I've sort of worked my way up in various organisations, which you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. Do you, would you, so would you recommend that people getting into journalism in your kind of, in your route, you would recommend they didn't go to university and went it, and found their own kind of way there? What do you think? I think don't study journalism. If, if you're, if you're yeah. going to university to study journalism, I think that's a mistake. I think that a lot of people do that and it puts you in a very sort of one-sided mould, as it were, like... Everyone goes through the same, everyone's taught the same kind of subjects and topics and journalism, it's not a profession, it's a trade, it's something that anyone can pick up, anyone can do. 
and you can learn the skills required very very quickly just by getting involved and join you know if you do um start off freelance and pitch your articles to various newspapers or online websites and then eventually you might get a job as a i don't know in an apprenticeship or whatever into a newspaper and you can learn the skills so so quickly just by being around the people mm. if you're a good writer and you've got a good ear for a good story um then you can be a journalist and again the way that i got into it was through video journalism mm -hmm. and that's an area which is really really growing mm -hmm. and where there's a huge audience as we've discussed already on youtube so i think that if you're a young person interested in journalism don't just be focusing on either going to university which is let's be honest i don't know what your experiences were like but i think um, there's basically an indoctrination factory. You've got a load of debt. Yeah, you'll be and isolated so if you. Yeah, you will be isolated. Yeah. Right? So you'll be Tory scum. Even even by the lecturers, you'll be known. Well, exactly. So I think all even of these reasons not... suggest that you shouldn't perhaps go to uni. I'm not saying don't definitely don't do it if you're set if your mind's set on it. If you're really academic, you know, yeah. I'm sure there are some courses which are, which are great. But yeah. if you want to be a journalist, I don't think it's necessarily the best route to take. I said a lot of people do that. And I think if you're really sort of persistent and have a good uh, work ethic and an interest in journalism and interest in ideas and politics and so on, um, you can succeed. Yeah, definitely. So a big theme of your investigative work recently has been wokeness in the civil service. And obviously the right wing press and Tory party complain about this, but the problem just seems to be getting worse. Do you think that Rishi and the people around him actually care about this? Or is it almost another level of virtue signaling where they are pretending that they want the wokeness out of the civil service, but they really are just fine with it? I think it's definitely the latter of those two uh, choices, unfortunately. Yeah. The Conservatives have been in power for 14 years. Okay, yes, some of it was with the Liberal Democrats or whatever. They still have had the ability to reform the Equality Act. They didn't do that, which is where a lot of this uh, wokeness comes from within the civil service. And actually the recent story that I've been doing is focused on the armed forces, which is just absolutely extraordinary that this stuff is actually penetrating an institution, which one would assume is one of the most conservative institutions in Britain, where you have these kind of straight white men on the most part, who have generally con patriotic conservative tendencies. Um, even they have been taken over mm -hmm. by woke ideologues. And uh, some of the stories that we publish, for example, they're lowering security checks and for ethnic minority recruits to become uh, intelligence officers in the armed forces to boost yeah. representation and so on. They're also talking about non-binary personnel allowing men to wear makeup on parades, giving them gender neutral toilets, telling them to use gender neutral um, terms, uh, telling them to introduce their pronouns, saying, hello, I'm Sergeant Smith and my pronouns are they no. then? That's an actual example from the MOD's uh, diversity policies and this is why Grant Shapps and this is a really good point that you make he claims that he's launching this review and mm. so on but let's be honest if, if you know all of these policies have been invented in the last few years all of these documents that I was researching and looking at and being leaked to mm. um, they all came from the last few years and they've all came from when the conservatives were in charge conservative ministers were in charge and they were informed about this stuff specifically on the armed forces we know I mean we quote someone in our article Edward Stringer who was an air, air marshal and he used to be the head of the UK Defence Academy. It's a huge sort of um, institution which uh, educates people in the armed forces. And he says in our article, I raised these concerns at the highest levels. They were aware of this. The Tories were aware of this. The chief of staff were aware of this. And yet it happened anyway. So all of this virtue signaling, and I think that's yeah. a good word, um, I think is bluster. That's really depressing. Yeah. So to having interviewed a few Tory ministers, um, do you think that they are scared of being right wing or do they just not actually believe in it? I think that on the cultural issues, the ones yeah. that we're specifically talking about, I don't think that the Conservative ministers have a strong feeling either way. Mm -hmm. I think that ideologically there's a vacuum in the Conservative Party. And we've seen this since David Cameron's uh, sort of modernization of the Tory party, where you've got the selection of MPs based on things that not, not to do with conservative ideology, but other um, uh, sort of tick boxes, uh, particularly um, women. They wanted to increase the number of women on the candidates list, which is, which is great, I'm sure. But at the same time, they weren't necessarily tick choosing the right people, the most conservative people. Yeah. Um, and so I think that we, basically the, the problem goes down to what's happened to the Tory party ever since 2005 and 
do conservatives, conservative ministers care about wokeism in their departments? Well, the evidence would suggest that they don't, because and that they may they might make the, make the argument that well we're too busy focusing on other things, there are other priorities, um, we weren't aware of this stuff. Well, that's almost more depressing, isn't it? Because it shows yeah. that you're not competent. Yeah. So a lot of people think that we need a true conservative, a true right wing party that sort of outflanks the Tory party. Um, you know, we've got elections looming. Do you think that the Reform Party could be that force? I think, unfortunately, the evidence suggests that it won't be that force. Um, although it's rising in the opinion polls and so on, I think it all depends a, a lot of if Nigel comes back and he leads the party. Yeah. He's he's a, such a cult figure. Um, yeah. You know, even... I know it was a controversial move, but him going on, I'm a celebrity, and so many people who were like... Oh, I don't, I don't like his views, but he's such a great guy, isn't he? Um, you know, got into the final of a popular TV competition. Well, despite. you were trying to let him win, weren't you? Didn't you vote about a thousand times? To try <laughs> yeah, to my win? phone bill came through for that. And no, I had fifty pounds in extra charges. I just wanted to. Win. Came I wanted it was win rigged. I had to be it honest. was a recount. <laughs> I reckon it was rigged. You're not calling well. for a January sixth <laughs> moment, are you? Some people, <laughs> some people wanted this outside of ITV studios. Oh, no. get, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. get the headdress on and storm. Yeah. But I absolutely do not support mm. that. Um, but we were out for dinner the night of the finals. And I was terrible company because I was constantly on the phone calling for ITV voting for night. <laughs> Wasting She's my so money. Hardcore. <laughs> no. I think it's impressive. I think, yeah. Do, do, you, do you guys feel like sort of warriors in a way sort of anti -war warriors. oh what someone commented on a picture of me and amy that we were shield maidens of the right <laughs> the only time i voted for the conservatives was when i was a candidate in local elections i voted for myself so you voted yourself yeah. okay yeah. that's that's kind of an, an exception i, I would say so, you if you're mine thank you even if i she was i was the first runner up even but that was a month before i left the party why did you leave? Um, I left. The final straw for me was they were going to introduce vaccine passports for nightclubs. Mm. And I wouldn't have been able to go to nightclubs. And I thought if this party is discriminating against me, then I will not be a part but it a member of it. It wasn't even just nightclubs there. It was like everything. Even you was the final straw for Yeah, me, yeah, yeah. Because that was like really extreme. But... They were talking about you can come back to uni or you can go to uni if you hadn't had one. Yeah. Which is just ridiculous. But they, but they felt they could sort of party in Downing Street and everything and whilst oh, putting yeah. these restrictions on. on yeah. And, and, and I, for that whole time, I'm so happy because I basically had Julia Hartley Brewer to wake up to. <laughs> and then I would always watch the Trigger Notching videos. So yeah. it's the only way I felt sane. Um, Instead and, of going um, to the nightclubs. <laughs> well, you can go anyway. She should be aware of that. <laughs> Back in lockdown, <laughs> I think there were some secret like clubs going on. Sure I've heard about this. Well, I actually for for um, one of the lockdown years, so I went to Exeter and I worked at this like it called itself a four star hotel. It was a two star hotel at best, but um, it was great there. It was like faulty towers. Everyone said all of the tradies and the contracting. Um, sort of come, build, builders and electricians to come down and stay at the hotel. It was great. And because our owner, Joe, didn't like lockdown whatsoever, he basically, it was like a lockdown-free zone. So I'd come to work and we'd just be partying, drinking, all of that. Mm. I also had a pretty lockdown-free job during lockdown years, but very different to uh, your party zone in the hotel mm. because I worked as a nursery teacher. So... This was the perfect job because you cannot social distance from two-year-olds and you weren't allowed to wear a mask because they would scare them. And life just felt normal. And I, yeah, apart from my weekends, it just felt like everything was completely normal. Apart from we had to constantly debt all everything, but it was just so refreshing. Like I could not imagine what it would have been like to be working from home in a flat share with people that you found on spare room 
Um, and a lot of people have not changed from that situation yeah. because they yeah. turned to working from home and they're still doing that. Yeah, what baffles me is some people really enjoyed that. And I find that so sad. No. Because I bet they're depressed. Anyway. Anyways, but... Yeah. Frank, everyone's situation was different, though, because I was very lucky to live in the countryside. I could get out and enjoy nature. Um, I get on well with my family. I lived at home. Mm. And I had a job that felt normal. So... Yeah. Some people were just in dire dire situations yeah so but yeah. but now we can party and i'll tell you there's one party that we really smashed <laughs> <laughs> and it did actually we ended up making um making front page news did you yeah i didn't know that <laughs> at the gv news the GV conservative news party. conference party yeah <laughs> wait so what happened i you need to tell me the story well, we we ended up having a bit of a dance with Nigel Farage, our favourite icon. I don't even remember this bluff. <laughs> we didn't make kind of strange news. Well, I think we did. I think well, who Maybe you did in, in my mind or something. Uh, or maybe Twitter. that's just what I told everybody. Right. Yeah. But So you dance with Nigel. Have you have you had experience dancing with Nigel? Um you could say that in a metaphorical sense. Uh, <laughs> 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 I've worked, I've worked yeah. for Nigel. What was that like? <laughs> you danced the tango. I, I danced the political tango with him. Yeah. Um, well, I first met Nigel when I was 18 or 19. And actually, my first job in politics was in the same office as Nigel, as where Nigel worked. It was where his office was, so like one floor below. So I saw him every day and so on. And um, I think Nigel and I, our personalities are quite different. Um, He's a big sort of lad, drinker. You know, he loves a party. Um, as I said earlier, I'm a bit more nerdy. Um, I like to work. Although I'm not saying he's not a hard word worker. He's, <laughs> fast, he's much harder worker than I am. But, uh, but he does love a pint and he does love a, um, a cigarette. Um, so, so I think it was odd. In some ways, in that sense, it was odd working with, working for Nigel. Yeah. Um, and yeah. he was always like, I'll give you a good example. I mean, even today, I'm good. So tonight, I, he wants to, me to go on his show on GB News to talk about some of the stories that I've been publishing at The Telegraph. And he's obsessed with the fact that I've got a beard and he thinks I've got, a, he calls it a left wing beard. Does he like you to shave it off? He hates it. And it's like, he tells me, every time he sees me, he tells me to shave it. Well, actually, before, when we were, before we had you on today, we were obviously being good little researchers <laughs> and we basically just looked through the images section on Google of you. <laughs> we just you looked, searched Stephen Edgerton on Google Images. You look phenomenal without a beard and, a, and but with a tan. I, I love you, but... I hate facial hair. Oh, you say, I say, everyone's saying I should shave it. Oh, it does suit you, but when I saw those bit. pictures of you without the beard, I was like... I wasn't expecting to like it as much as I did. So not, Nigel is very much on your side of this debate then. I mean, look, I was just going to yeah. say, even this morning, <laughs> when on the phone, he was like, um, invite me onto the show and everything. And he said, um, oh, you better, <laughs> he's better said something like, you better tidy yourself up. <laughs> we all that, know what that Honestly, that's, oh, that's, he's obsessed with it. Every time I see him, he, he, he has a go at me about it. <laughs> Um, but whatever. <laughs> Not um, many people can say Farage is my style advisor. No. I wonder um, what, does, when we invite him on, we'll ask us what he'd change about us. Well, I hope he wouldn't say anything because we're personal. I don't think he'd be that rude. I, th I think he would be very polite. <laughs> I, I'd like to think so. Yeah. He's so much fun, though. Yeah. Like, I love a party. Yeah. Amy loves a party. <laughs> so Stephen, we get to party. At we'll get you to loosen up. Maybe the beard's holding you back. <laughs> No, no, no. He's rugged. I think, I don't know. I am I did a whole, I was asked by a producer to go on Talk TV just to talk about my beard. And I said, no. Because Are you going to get paid for apparently it? Apparently this thing is, it's become, it's uh, sort of a national news item now. Stephen's no, beard. <laughs> no, you've, what it, you've become the news no, item. What, what, it, what it was, was there was this thing in the news about Tory MPs shaving their beards because they could attract voters better or something. They, th they said that this would gain them votes on the doorstep if they attract, they'd, if they'd shave their beards. And mm. this talk TV guy was like, um, can you send us loads of photos of you without your beard? And then we want to do like a whole comparison section and we're talking about- Who would of, you vote for? Yeah, would you vote for Stephen with or without the beard? Um, Could we put in a picture of Stephen with let's, the beard? Let's get a lovely Stephen of- Stephen without the beard. Stephen with a tan. The one with the tan. Because Why do I have a tan? I can't remember. You were on TV. Oh, they must have powdered me up or something. I never, I'm not, I'm a very, I, I burn I had very some easily. Clinique bronzer on. I can imagine. Maybe they sort of made me look like Trump or something. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I didn't want to go for that. Well, you guys didn't oh, offer any makeup today. I was a bit sort of upset about that. I thought, oh, um, maybe next time. Well, we just knew that you'd like grey anyway, exactly. and because we spoke to Nigel, he said he'd got you to tidy up, so yeah, we thought you you'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're obviously um, a young, eligible bachelor. I don't know <laughs> what's going on in your private life or anything, but if you were going to go on to have a family anytime soon. Would you want to have kids in Britain? Like, would you, like, is Britain where you'd want to bring up kids? It's a good question. I think um, it's something I obviously have thought about. You know, I do, I think I do want kids eventually. Um, Britain does seem like a place in which bringing up a family not only is economically difficult because of house prices and childcare costs and mm -hmm. all of those things. But also, um, I think culturally, it's, I, I'm worried that the education system will lead to a, a certain level of indoctrination in, in, in terms of um, what teachers are telling my children and so on. And I do worry that even in the private uh, school system, if, if I was able to afford that, which I, at the moment I definitely cannot, um, uh, even there, there might be issues of kind of teaching wokeism and, and terrible ideas uh, in school. So I think it's a good question. Um, and, you know, I'm I'm really thinking about where I want to live in the future. And maybe that isn't Britain. I don't know. Um, if if not, where? That's the hard one, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of um, films recently in Poland, mm, which seems like a really fun. kind of amazing place, amazing people, amazing culture. Um conservative to a large degree in a way that Britain really isn't. And I think that's partly because of their communist past. They kind of understand what it's like yeah. to live under that communist system. However, learning Polish is also very, very hard. And I don't know if I'm, I mean, I'm rubbish yeah. at languages. So um, that's a, that is definitely a downside. Mm -hmm. Potentially America, they also face similar issues. But I think that there are some states like Florida where yeah. um, the education system is definitely being kind of reformed mm -hmm. and it's certainly economically a lot easier to raise a family it's cheaper um the salaries are better so um sure it's something i've thought about and, and obviously there's no language barrier so maybe it's maybe somewhere like florida maybe somewhere in america mm -hmm. yeah but probably not the uk potentially the uk i don't know the thing is it's mm -hmm. difficult isn't it in I a perfect world in a perfect world i'd stay in my country i love my country i'm patriot yeah. patriotic um, I, yeah. I don't want to abandon it, but then there are other considerations as well. Yeah. So I don't know. Let's see. Let's see where my life takes me. I've, I think um, there are some, I won't mention exactly what's going on, but there are some opportunities. Uh, my career might be changing quite soon. So yes. um, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. What other things do you think holds the conservative movement or conservatism, social conservatism back from building momentum? I think that, it's a very uncool and very unsexy thing, social conservatism among young people in particular. And mm. my, from my experience, most people who are my age or around my age um, feel that conservative ideas are bigoted. They feel that we are racist. They think that we don't like the poor. They have very, very basic and simple beliefs or sort of characterizations of what conservatism is. So I think that's mm. probably the major thing holding us back in terms of appealing to the wider population, particularly younger people, because older people are generally more conservative and agree with us on many of these issues. But I think there's just a total misunderstanding of what conservatism is yeah. among the younger generations. Um, and that basically labels us both as evil, but also very, very uncool. Has that, has that held you back in finding relationships and dating? It's a difficult question. I don't think, in some ways it hasn't, because... I've, in my experience, this is just my experience, <laughs> um, many people, many women aren't that concerned about um, polit political beliefs. Really? Um, well, I think it's the other way around. Possibly, I don't know. I'm just talking about my own, yeah. I can't say for, for everyone. But um, Women are more easily swayed than men. Do you reckon? I, I've got so many male friends who are pretty firmly on the right and have centrist leftist girlfriends who just adore them. Or well, just flip-flop. But... Yeah. Some of them I, see it as like a kind of edgy thing as well. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But also, I mean, to be honest, it has come up in dates where they've asked me about uh, my politics. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, like almost immediately. Yeah. Some of them have done weird things like 
they reverse image search my uh, my image. No. And they'll like know everything about me. That happened one time. Uh, so that was quite weird. Mm. Um, and so in that sense, yes, it does. But then also there are like conservative women and that's also, you know. Yeah. They're not just, enough. Just hard to find. Well, maybe you can help persuade them. I don't know. Yeah, well, that brings us... <laughs> so that brings us to the end of the free section of this episode of Bombshells. But if you head to basedmedia.org, you can get a premium subscription for as little as £5 a month where you will get access to the full extended version of this and of the weekly skeptic loads more premium content there's going to be loads of interesting people lined up for interviews and more podcast shows so definitely get on there and um subscribe and in the second part of this episode we're going to be talking to Stephen about demographic changes in the west immigration um we're going to be giving him some dating advice he's going to be given some anonymous people with dilemmas some dating advice and relationship advice and some odd questions as well so yeah not not one to miss it gets juicy (laughs) 